Do we have any Phillies fans in the room? All right. Well, I grew up. I grew up uh, as I. All right. That's that's not ne that's not necessary. As you know, I, I grew up about 45 minutes from here uh, in South Jersey, about 20, 25 minutes from, from Philadelphia. So I grew up a huge Philly sports fan, still am a huge Philly sports fan. So I know that you're not completely connected to the outside world right now, but I thought I'd give you a little update. Uh, the Phillies are playing the Dodgers this week, uh, game one. Uh, they won 10 to one. So, and last night, they won four to three. So uh, they're doing well even without your support right now. So. We're going to be uh, in Psalm chapter 90, just one psalm over uh, from where we were yesterday. So have your Bible with you this morning uh, and invite you to find Psalm chapter 90. I hope you're doing well today. I know uh, a lot of times when we get to Thursday morning, that fatigue uh, really starts to set in and we all feel that. I, I know I felt it this morning and so uh, I, I know we're feeling that, but I, I'm, I'm prayerf prayerfully hopeful that uh, we'll be awake enough, alert enough uh, to be open to what God wants to speak into our lives today. As we come to Psalm 90, we're going to return uh, to interacting with Moses. We began our week with Moses. And we began our week with Moses having this incredible, glorious encounter with the very presence of God as he asked God this extraordinarily bold request, God, would you show me your glory? And I challenged you, I challenged myself, to ask God that same question. Would you reveal your glory, your goodness to us that we might see you, that we might know you? And God brought him up on the mountain and he let his glory pass by and he sheltered him and he covered him. And then he spoke to him and he revealed his name, his personal name, and then that he was compassionate, that he was gracious, that he was patient, that he was full of chesed, that he abounded in it, that he maintained that chesed, that loyal love for a thousand generations, that he was a forgiving God, and that he was also a just God. And so Moses has this extraordinary encounter. He comes down on the mount, from the mountain glowing from having been in the presence of God. And we would hope or think, it, it will always be great for Moses now. Like Life's never going to be the same, and, and it wasn't, but that did not mean that life was always great. In fact, it didn't mean that Moses wouldn't have days of struggle. It didn't mean that Moses wouldn't have days of sin. And in Psalm chapter 90, we're going to come to a time in Moses' life where the days are not the best days. Because after his glorious encounter with God, there were many hard days. God would lead them. His presence would go with them. And they came to the place where they were to begin to prepare to enter the promised land. And they sent the 12 spies and ten of them come back, and they're like, there's no way, there's giant people there, and it's, there's fortified cities, and the, the, we'll all die if we go there. And two, Joshua and Caleb were like, it's an amazing place. It, it's filled with incredible produce, there's milk and honey. He's like, God's given it to us, let's go. And the people, they give in to the fear of the ten. And they rebel against God, and God judges them, and says, for 40 years, you'll wander in the wilderness, and this entire generation will die. And then I'll take my people into the promised land. Moses had to endure that. There were other rebellions. There were all kinds of plagues and the never-ending funerals. Right As this generation dies off, as we look at census data that we have in the scriptures, we don't know for sure, but we can come up with a, a guess that around 70 people a day would have been dying. Right? Right? That, that's hard. It was hard on Moses. And as we come to Psalm 90, not only that, but it's most likely the context of Psalm 90 is that Moses' siblings, right, Miriam and Aaron, right, the one who hid him and, and protected him when he was a baby and arranged for his care, his brother Aaron, who was his right-hand man, his confidant, his, the one he leaned on, even though he had failed him at one time, they both have died. And not only that, but Moses has done something foolish. Have you ever done anything foolish? All right. There's something, we can find some common ground there, can't we? Even godly people, even people who have encountered the glory of God are not incapable of doing something foolish. God gave him specific instructions on how he was to demonstrate God's provision for water. But instead of obeying God, 
in anger, Moses struck a rock when he was supposed to speak to the rock. And because of that, God says, Moses, you're not going to get to ever enter the promised land. And so with all of that, the death of his siblings, the constant, the constant years of wandering, of suffering, of death, of funerals, of experiencing God's own judgment, Moses composes a song, a hymn, a psalm. And we find it in Psalm chapter 90. And so let's dive into this psalm because in this psalm, I believe we're going to understand some extraordinary things about God and some important things for us to know in our walk with Christ. So Psalm chapter 90, beginning in verse 1. Moses says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And so Moses begins this, this psalm, this hymn, with a reminder. He says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place. Right? And Moses knew what it was like to have life disrupt. He grew up in a home that wasn't his. He grew up in the palace of Egypt, but it wasn't his real home. Right? He was a Hebrew, not an Egyptian. And then, of course, after murdering the the Egyptian man that was oppressing his people, he has to dwell in the wilderness, in the backside of nowhere for 40 years. And now it's been years and years of wandering. No real home. But Moses knew, and Moses realized that God offered a home, a dwelling place. That word means refuge. He says, Lord, you have been our refuge through, through all generations. He says, before the mountains were born, Right before you created the world, he says, you are God. You are everlasting to everlasting. And Moses begins this song, this hymn, this, this, this composition that he writes. He begins it by, by thinking about who God is. Right? And it's important. Remember, I, I, I gave you that challenge on Monday, that question. What's the first thing that you think about when you think about God? Then he turns, though, to the frailness of human life. Notice verses 3 through 6. He says, you turn people back to dust. And remember, Moses, right? he sees this every day. And now it's very personal. His dear siblings, Miriam and Aaron. He says, you turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by. Or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. This is a man who's personally been impacted by the frailty of human existence. And if you live any time at all on this earth, you know what it's like to be impacted by the frailty of human existence. Whether it is the loss of a loved one, whether it is wrestling with the the brevity of of life, and Moses is, is deeply aware. He's deeply aware of the, of the brevity of this life. It's weighing on him. And then not only that, but he's deeply aware of his sin and the sin of his people. Look at verse 7. He says, We are consumed by your anger, and we are terrified by your indignation. For you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath, and we finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger, for your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. And so you can just feel and sense the angst, the weight that is upon Moses' heart at this time. As he's pondering his life, what is it about? What, what, what is it all adding up to? You can see a man that is wrestling and a man that's struggling. And understandably so. And there are times in life, we, we talked yesterday about the fact that there are many things in life that we don't understand. God's providence doesn't always seem to match His promises. And we wrestle and we struggle. And here, Moses is, is in his wrestling, he, he has come to an understanding that our suffering, much of our suffering, is because of our own sin and our own rebellion. Not all suffering is connected to personal sin. In fact, much of our suffering, 
we might look at our life and say, this, this, isn't, con- this isn't connected to a choice that I made or a rebellion against God. It's just something in His providence God has permitted or allowed. But Moses here, he's lamenting and he's grieving. He's overwhelmed. And maybe you can identify. You can say, I know what it's like to feel absolutely overwhelmed. To just feel like, I don't know if I can do this anymore. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can handle another day. I, I don't know how I'm going to get through. I, this is too, what I'm facing, it's too much. It's too heavy. Too difficult. But Moses has a context as he processes his feelings. Right? His context is that he had met God on the mountain. God had revealed His glory to him. He knew the character of God. He knew the heart of God. And even as he wrestles with God's judgment, and he wrestles with God's righteous judgment, he remembers the God that he met on that mountain, on Mount Sinai. He remembers that He's a God of compassion. He remembers that He's a God of grace that He's patient, that He abounds, that He overflows in hased, that He is willing to treat them not as they deserve to be treated, but He's willing to do for them what they don't deserve. And so He says this in verse 12. He says, Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord. How long will it be? There's that, that, that question that comes up so often in the Psalms. How long, Lord? How long? can't go on much longer. Have compassion on your servants. He knows he can ask this. Right? He knows that he doesn't have the right, that even though he has not the right to expect it, that he doesn't deserve it, he has the right to ask for God's compassion because that's who God is. He is compassionate. He is gracious. He is slow to anger. And so he asked God, Have compassion on your servants. And then notice verse 14. Satisfy us in the morning. This is going to be a really important phrase and an important theme. Satisfy us in the morning. You know, there's something about morning. Now, how many of you would say, I am not a morning person? All right. Many of you, at least half. Right? Mornings are tough if you're not a morning person. But even if you're not a morning person, there's still something about a new... Whenever you... You know, some of you like to begin your day a little later than others, right? But whenever you begin your day, there's something about a new day that reminds us there's a fresh start, a fresh chance. And so Moses says, satisfy us. It's a word that that would often be described as the feeling that you get after an incredible meal. Right? I just I just take just take a 10 seconds. I want you to think about the best meal that you ever had. It probably wasn't in our cafeteria, but think about that, that, that meal. Or maybe it's the favorite thing that your mom makes, or your dad makes, or your grandmother makes. That, that meal that you just say, when I eat that, man, I feel satisfied. That's this word here. And Mo- Moses says, satisfy us in the morning with what? Your chesed, your unfailing love. That, he says, that's what we need. That's what we need again. We need to know and experience your unfailing love. In the midst of all these funerals and the weight of the consequence of my own sin and the sins of the people and all that, I need to know that you love me, God. I need to feel and experience and encounter your love again. He says, and not just me, but the people, that we may sing for joy and be glad all of our days. He says, I want to I be able to have that joyful song again. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. And may the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. You know, life as you will discover, goes by really quick. When I was your age, I thought, life doesn't go by so fast. Right? I, I, I got a long time. I'm just a teenager. I've got all my life to live. And I hope that all of you have many, many, many years. I hope that God favors you with many years on this earth to serve Him and to know Him and to glorify Him and to live for the purpose for which you were created. 
But I want to promise you, it goes by fast. It, it shocks me to say that it was 29 years ago that I was a camper. It doesn't feel like 29 years. It feels like a few years ago. Life goes by so quickly. And that, that can be depressing if we only look at this life. If, if we think that this is all there is, if this is it, it's really depressing. But notice what Moses says. He says, teach us to number our days. They may go by quickly, but they matter. They may go by quickly, but they matter. God has a purpose for your days. God created you. He shaped you. He fashioned you. He formed you. If you're in Christ, if you're a follower of Jesus, right, He chose to save you and to redeem you, to make you His child. And so you belong to Him. You are an object of His love and His affection and His grace, His compassion, His mercy, His kindness, His goodness. But not only that, He has a purpose for your life. And Moses, you can see, he, he's, he's, as he's remembering God's love and he's asking to be satisfied with it once again, to have joy once again, he's also asking for purpose to be restored. Notice that last verse. He says, may your favor rest on us establish the work of our hands. Moses knows that what he's doing, if it's God's blessing is on it, God's favor is on it, it matters. Think about this. We're sitting here thousands of years later reading these very words. I, I, I don't know that Moses could have imagined that. Right? That yes, his days seemed brief and they were flying by and the reality of death was ever present in his life. But what God does in you and through you matters forever. And so we ask God for compassion, for satisfaction, for joy to be restored. And you know, yes, life is hard and life is difficult and there are dark days and difficult days, but God does want you to know his joy. I had an incredible experience several years ago. Uh, I was on a mission trip in the Dominican Republic and we were going around to Compassion International sites and visiting the kids. And we had went there to give them soccer balls and Bibles. And, but the real reason we discovered we went there is they felt so honored to have someone come to them. And they would put on a program for us. Everywhere we went, they had, they had put a program together and songs and different things. And this one, this one place we went to, I mean, you could just walk. You walked into this place and it's, it was in a town that was filled with poverty. These, they didn't have nothing as far as material things. And there was just this palpable excitement in this room. And they, these kids were, I mean, you know how kids can be, but these kids were over the top excited. And at one point in their program, they started doing a Congo line. So their worship looked a little different, right? Can you imagine sing time like that? And they invited us to join. Stretched us out of our comfort zone a little bit. And they were singing a song in Spanish, and I, I know a little bit of Spanish, but not enough to, to really catch on to the whole song. And so we asked one of our translators, who said, what was that song about. And they said, that song is a song about how our God is a joyful God. And these kids, they were filled with this real joy that didn't come from circumstances or stuff or things, but it actually came from God. And so God does offer you his joy. And so Moses prays a prayer for relief, a prayer that God would restore that joy, that he'd restore perspective, and that he would satisfy them in the morning with his love and his grace and restore them to purpose. And I just want each of you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has a purpose for your life. God has a plan for your life. You're not an accident. Right? God shaped you, he formed you, and he has a purpose and a plan for your life. And sometimes the journey of life will help, will lead us to a place where God's purpose doesn't seem clear or we feel far from his purpose or we don't understand that purpose. And God calls us back to him. And there's, there's a key word that I think that, that I want you to hang on to. And it's the word recall. You see, for Moses, he recalled what God had done in the past. He recalled how God had revealed him, himself to him in the past. He remembered. The prophet Jeremiah had to do the same thing. If Jeremiah is indeed the author of Lamentations... We don't know for certain, but it's, it's quite likely. And, and in Jer Lamentations chapter 3, um, the, the, the prophet Jeremiah is, 
is lamenting about the condition of his life. You see, Jeremiah's ministry was extraordinarily difficult. Jeremiah's ministry was largely a ministry of prophesying messages that were not listened to, that were rejected. Not only that, but they came at the cost of often brutal persecution. He bore an incredible, incredible price, imprisonment. And this is, this is how he, he spoke in Lamentations chapter 3. He said, I am a man who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again. He has made my skin and my flesh grow old and broken my bones. Right? I mean, we can all step back and say, this is a man who's struggling deeply. Right? He's describing his pain and his suffering in the most vivid and graphic of ways. He says, he has made me to dwell. There's that word dwell, right? You know, as, as Moses recounted God as his dwelling place, he says, you've made me to dwell in darkness like those long dead. He has walled me in and I cannot escape. He weighed, has weighed me down with chains. And even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has barred my way with blocks of stone and he's made my paths crooked. Like a bear lying in wait, like a lion in hiding, he dragged me from the path and mangled me and left me without help. He drew his bow and made me the target of his arrows. He pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. I became the laughingstock of all my people. They mock me in song all day long. Can you imagine people mocking you in song all day long? Like, I mean, all of us have probably had someone make fun of us. Right? Sometimes it's friendly, right? It's good banter with our friends. Sometimes it's not so good. And I I know, you know, how many, you know, all of, most of you in here have survived the middle school years, right? They're tough, aren't they? Man, I got picked on a lot. I got made fun of. It hurts. But here, here he says, people mock me and, like, they have composed songs just to mock me. He has filled me with bitter herbs and given me gall to drink. He has broken my teeth with gravel and trampled me in the dust. I have been deprived of peace and I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say, my splendor is gone and all that I hoped from the Lord, all I had hoped from the Lord. He says, all my expectations, what I thought God was going to do in me, what I thought he had called me to, what I I thought my purpose was, he says, my hope, it's gone. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I remember them. My soul is downcast within me. I'm depressed. This is Jeremiah's honest expression. But then notice what he says. Yet, yet I call to mind. I, I, I recall something. I, I, I choose to call it to my mind. And he says, therefore I have hope. He says, because of the Lord's said. We don't perish. God's judgment was fierce because the people constantly, constantly rejected him. They rejected his warnings. They rejected his love. They rejected his goodness. And so God did bring judgment. And Jeremiah not only had to warn the people, he had to witness it. He had to bear it. But he says, even in God's judgment, he still maintains his hesed. He says, we do not perish. Right? God didn't wipe them all out. In fact, God protected many of them, brought them back later out of captivity. Why? Because His mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I will say, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will put my hope in Him. He was able to be honest about His suffering, about His disappointment, and and about how He felt like God had been unfair and unkind. But then He says, I recall, I remember what's true. Yes, I feel like this, and I need to, we talked about yesterday, we need to express to God the honesty of our heart. We need to be honest with Him about our struggles, our doubts, our questions, our frustrations, or even when we think He hasn't kept His end of the bargain. But then He says, but I recall what I know is true. And He says, your mercies are new when? Every morning. You know, life is filled with hard days. Days like Moses when he composed Psalm 90. Days where he looked around and as he wrestled with his own grief and feelings and hopelessness, he realized that he could still turn to God, that God was still who he was, that the same God he met on Mount Sinai was the same God that was still with him, and that he could call out to him and he could ask for his compassion 
and he could ask for his mercy, and he could ask for his joy to be restored and his purpose to be restored. And so I just want to point us to three things, three, three points of application, three things that I believe God offers you and he offers me. Number one, that he offers us to know him as our dwelling place. God offers you an opportunity to know Him. To know Him as your dwelling place. Right? You know, there's something about home. If if home is a good place for you, and I hope that it is. For, For many of you, I know it is. Maybe not all. But if home is a good place, there's something about home. There's something about your room, your bed, your parents cooking. Right? A shower you don't have to share, maybe. Anybody? Are you... Yeah, there's something about home. When you're tired, when you're hurting, when you're sick, where do you want to be? You want to be home. And we all have this longing within us for home, but we also all have a strange realization that in this world we never actually feel completely at home. And I want you to know that God offers you a place of refuge, a place to be at home, a place to be healed, to be restored. When you're tired, when you're hopeless, when you're struggling, you can run to him and say, God is my dwelling place. I don't understand everything he's allowing. Not all of it makes sense to me right now. But God's my dwelling place. And I can go to him. Maybe for you it's to to recognize him as Savior. Maybe you've never actually come to that place where you've acknowledged that you need a Savior, that you need to be forgiven of your sin, that you need to be... God is your dwelling place. And I'm praying that God would grant you faith to believe in him and to trust him because there's nothing better than knowing the God who created you. Knowing His love and His forgiveness and His compassion and His kindness and His goodness. Knowing His hope. And so, allow God to be your dwelling place. Run to Him. Rest in Him. Meet with Him. Even when you're struggling. Number two. Psalm 90 is a call to know the seriousness of our sin. Yes, God is compassionate and gracious. And if you're in Christ, you will never bear the consequence or the curse of your sin eternally. Right? Jesus bore that curse. Jesus bore that consequence. He tasted death for you. He took the wrath of the Father. He died in your place. Right? And so why Paul, who was an incredible sinner, are, are, you, are you with me? Right? We know Paul, I mean, he sinned greatly. He participated in murder, persecution. He caused havoc in the church. But Paul could say, there is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8. And so I want you to to hear this in the sense that if you're in Christ, you will never bear the eternal consequence of your sin. And you can live free because of that. But there is temporary and temporal consequences to sin. And Moses was a witness of that. Moses was an example of that. He saw the harsh realities of sin. He knew he still belonged to God. He knew God still loved him. He knew that God was still compassionate and gracious and merciful. But there were 40 years of suffering and wandering because of sin. Plagues that he witnessed. And he watched people die horrible deaths because of sin. He now was bearing his own sorrow that he wouldn't get to go to the promised land. Although God, being compassionate and gracious, will let him see it. He saw people killed by serpents, endless funerals, years and years wasted in the wilderness. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I, I led our church youth group on a missions trip. We were actually in Harrisburg, and uh, we were divided into some different areas, serving in downtown Harrisburg. And one of our groups, we were helping at a boys and girls club, and our, our task that week was actually to paint and clean it up because the kids were coming the next week. Well, we, in the midst of all that, th- this guy came in one day, and uh, a little bit rough-looking guy, but he started, uh, he asked if he could uh, share a little bit with our youth. And he shared a little bit of his story. He's 65 years old. And two years prior, he had come to know Christ. But he talked about the fact that he wasted so much of his life living in sin. And he lamented the wasted years. And he, wanted, he, said, it was the first, he said God had put on his heart to share his He had never shared his testimony publicly. So we got to be his test run. But he warned our kids, and it was a very vivid moment. I don't think I'll ever forget it. He warned them. He says, don't buy into the lies that Satan offers. Don't don't go down those paths. Don't waste your life. And Moses could look at the same thing, and he would tell us, don't waste your life. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. 
And Satan is very deceptive. And our own desires, right? It's, it's very easy. And so I want this psalm to remind us of the seriousness of sin. And number, number three, I want to challenge you to know God's chesed every morning. To experience it and to encounter it. At each day, right? Moses cried out. He says, God, satisfy us this morning. Satisfy us in the morning with your love. Like the satisfaction of a great meal. And I want to invite you. And, and you know, you might say, I'm not a morning person. When I study the Bible or do my devotions, it's not first thing in the morning. And that, that's fine. But I want to invite you, before you jump into your day, before you just to say, God, may I experience your chesed today. May I experience, may I encounter your faithful love, your loyal love. May, may I know it. May I experience it. May my life be shaped by it today. Jesus said this in John chapter 6. You don't have to turn there. Just listen. Jesus said, truly I tell you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said, I am. I am the bread of life. And no one who comes to me will ever be hungry. And no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. We all need fresh encounters with God's love. So that we can experience it. So that we can know it. And so that we can live it out. Because hesed isn't just something that you know about. It's not just something you sing about. But it's also something that you do. Right? Because God calls us to reflect His love and His kindness and compassion and grace to our world. I want to close with one last verse. It's a verse that David prayed, Psalm 143. I invite you to, to read it sometime. It's a very, very honest psalm of David's own struggles and his own pain. And he said this in Psalm 143, verse 8. He said, let me experience your faithful love in... Anybody want to guess? In the morning. Let me, experience, let me experience your faithful love in the morning because I trust in you. Reveal to me the way I should go because I appeal to you. When you encounter His love in the morning, He will guide you and direct you. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank You for uh, the privilege of being together this morning and just the opportunity we have to open Your Word, which is living and powerful and true, and allow Your Word to speak to us. Father, I pray that we would know you as our dwelling place and that even when we are overwhelmed, especially when we're overwhelmed, especially when it doesn't make sense and especially when we feel hopeless and helpless, that we would run to you and that we would know that you are our dwelling place and that we can come to you and be accepted, that we can come to you and be honest and that we can come to you and taste and see that you are good. So Lord, I ask that you would satisfy us with your love and Father, I pray that you would teach us the seriousness of our sin. I pray that we would be wise and trust you. And Father, I pray that we would encounter your love each and every morning so that we might live lives shaped by it, so that we can glorify you and live out the purpose for which you created us. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.